Thank you, thank you for spending Wednesday night with me. I know you guys could be at the bar, you could be doing anything today, but thank you for spending the time with me. And hopefully something big comes out of this session today for you guys. Um, a little bit about me, Vivek Betty. I have been in product for over 15 years. I know I don't look that old. Yes, but um, started off at Goldman Sachs. I was at Goldman for 13 years. Started off as an engineer, ironically. Went to Rutgers University, if anyone from Jersey. Yeah, Rutgers. Um, was a computer engineering, computer science major, and said, I'm going to be a developer and engineer for the rest of my life. About two years into doing that at Goldman, I said, I don't want to be an engineer anymore. I really want to be on the product side of things. So I spent a lot of time at Goldman thinking about digital communication. So think voice, video, text, internal Facebook, internal Twitter, social, global. How do you take an investment banking, pick up the phone industry, and how do you modernize it, right, from a communications perspective? Did quite a bit of that. Then towards my last role at Goldman, it was really around, I spent two years in California, uh, working with companies like Twilio and Blue Jeans. You've probably heard of them. They're not so little anymore. They're big companies. But you know, partnering with our banking team as we looked at how do we partner with startups and you know think about private equity deals with them. Um, I did a short stint for two years at a background check company, as exciting as that sounds. Um, but you know, it was really fo focused on how do we work with companies like Uber and Lyft at that time. Remember when you used to hear in the news that an international driver did something not so nice? It was really about how do you build a global background check process. I know a lot about background checks, more than anyone would, would want to know. Um, but background checks in the States are really easy. In international marks, they're ex extremely hard, <laughs> right? So as we were building out the global platform, so two years there, I was running product. Goldman acquired the company. A little bit of irony to the story, a little bit scripted. Um, but then after that, I said, startups are really exciting. I'm not going back to Goldman. This is so cool. So I ended up at LearnVest, and that's where I am right now. LearnVest is a basically company that's geared at fixing America's wallet. So think of it as through mobile and digital channels, you're putting in your financial information and you get connected to a digital guidance counselor. The digital guidance counselor manages money for you. 401k, emergency savings, paying off debt, and that person that's there for you, right? Uh, three months before I joined, they were also acquired by Northwestern Mutual, the big life insurance company based out of Milwaukee. We are also the innovation lab for Northwestern Mutual. So we're building out their digital, their web, their mobile, and there's 8,000 financial reps across the U.S. that sell life insurance and the product sets for them. I've been there for a year and a half. That's my quick story. A product person always has a story. Um, so I'm here to talk about something very different today, emotional intelligence for product management. Um, so I'm going to start with a quick question. Imagine you're on a special project and you're asked to work on a mobile app. You were talking about your mobile app. You're asked to work on a mobile app. There's a two-week deadline and you're going to be working late nights and you're going to be spending so much time on this app, right? And you're going to get immerse yourself in it. Who would be the one, just think about it just for a second, the sphere of folks that you either know or work with. Who would be that person that you want to be spending 24 hours, seven days a week for the next 14 days to come up with this concept? Okay? Give me some adjectives of who this person is. Any brave souls. What would you want this person to be if you're going to be spending so much time with them? Patient. Okay? Flexible. Flexible. Collaborative. Collaborative. Crisp. 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 Interesting. Thoughtful. Thoughtful. Empathetic. Empathetic. Yeah. Anything else? Funny. Funny. <laughs> the irony is none of them were smart, a great engineer, right? Great project management skills. If you're going to be forced to spend that much time with somebody, you better damn like that person, right? A lot of your answers were actually more on the softer side. And you know, if we think about that, right, and think about who we want to be confined with, you want to work with people that you like and you get along with and you understand their emotions. So that was just an interesting exercise. When I'm in a room full of developers, I get a different answer, right? It's like smart, understands code, can challenge me, architect, right? With product management, more than any profession, the software, emotional, compassionate side is extremely important. What is EQ? E I, as they say, there's all these technical definitions and you can look them up in you know, Wikipedia or your favorite tool, but honestly it comes down to me is how well can you manage your own emotions and how well can you adapt and 
learn others' emotions, okay? That's actually the tougher one. You know, a lot of people can manage their own emotions at times, <laughs> but learning and adapting to other people's emotions and reading them is an art and it's not a science. It takes a lot of time and practice. So that's emotional intelligence in a nutshell. A note about IQ, right? Um, how many times have you read an article about your favorite CEO that says, we recruit the smartest people, right? You see it all the time, right? Um, the irony is, every time I've interviewed somebody for a position, the number one question I ask them is, so what's your story, right? Just like I told you my two-minute story when I started, what's your story? And usually within two or three minutes, I know if I'm going to hire this person or not. That's all I need, two, three minutes. If you can tell a good story, you're gonna be a great product manager, right? Because it's all about telling stories and telling your aspect of it. It doesn't matter if you were from NYU or Columbia. It doesn't matter if you were the best engineer. Now, I'm not discounting IQ, extremely important. In professions like engineering, where you have to have logic, it's important. Data modeling, consulting, statistics, it's important. Now, what's the theme in all of that, though? The theme is the world's black and white, right? Think about your favorite engineer. I used to be one. The answer is simple. You can either come up with it or not come up with it, right? There's definitive solutions. There's actually like a simple purity there. You either know if you're gonna go left or right. You either know if it's possible or not. It's either a number or a fact. It's a very, very black and white world. The irony is, for us it's not, right? We live in the gray. I was just speaking to someone on our team who, by the way, has just graduated product school and joined LearnVest, plug for product school. Um, and what we were talking about is, man, we live in the gray. There's actually a great book called Living in the Gray that you guys should read, but it's all about you know, a product manager gets in a room and a lot of people are turning to the product manager to come up with a solution, and there's a developer in there, a designer, a QA, an engineer, a marketing person, a, you know, all these different backgrounds and business units, and everyone's really type A, they all have their own personalities, they all have their own opinions, and it's your job to actually manage not just the project and the product, but manage all the emotions, right? Because it's your job to drive this train and everyone's gonna get on it. It's not a black and white answer. There's no solution and formula. So this is where this influence in putting this together. We live in a world of what if, could if, but, what if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? Did you think about it this way? Should I do it this way? Maybe it should be that way. There's a lot more what ifs and maybes. As opposed to in a different profession, the answer could be black and white. We live in the gray. Just come to accept it as product managers. Once you embrace it, you, have, you can start managing your own emotions. <laughs> so what do I mean by EQ? Um, you know, I think that there's like a few definitions here. Um, Self-awareness, it all starts with that, is how can you manage your own emotions? Think about a time where you've been in a room, whether it's at work or it's at, personally, and someone is just pissing you off. Like they're just saying all the things that are internally just pissing you off, right? How do you react to that? And I think it's really important, and that's where the self-awareness comes in, is, you know, as they're saying words and more and more you're getting heated inside, you're getting boiled, how do you react to it? I used to react to it by lashing out, but then what I learned is that's not the right thing to do. And now the way I react to it is like, interesting, how could I have done that better? Give me some feedback. And that goes really to how do you react to it? So it's important to manage, to manage your emotions is we're all gonna get pissed, we're, we're all humans, right? But in the end of the day, how you react to them, and first point is just being self-aware. I am getting pissed off right now <laughs> at this comment, right? And the person, I'm not gonna name who on my team does this to me, but the person, it keeps pissing me off but how am I gonna to react to that? And what is the stance I'm gonna take? So that's the first part of it, and that really falls on the self-awareness and self-management. And then the other part is the social awareness. I think it's really important to read the room. When I walk into a meeting, the first thing I do is read the room. And it's a very quick exercise, it takes 30 seconds. Everyone walks into their meeting and they just put their laptop down or they put their notepad. Nobody looks around the room. I walk in and the first thing I say is, How's everyone doing? And I read the room. Within a 30 second glance, once you guys learn this art, you'll be able to say, you'll be able to see who's in a pissy mood, who's really excited about the meeting, who thinks this is a formality. You'll be able to pick up on those context clues. It's really important to be able to read other people's emotions as a product manager. Because remember, you're gonna be the one that kind of guides that cruise ship, right? 
Um, the second part of it is, how do you build the relationships after you read the room? I'll share a funny story with you. Is It's actually not a really funny story. It's actually a pretty bad story, but th this happened last week. I was working with someone on my marketing team, and you know we always joke around. It's always just you know funny, and she was really, really visibly upset. I can tell by her arms, her motions. She was just out of it, right? And we're in a big meeting, and I was able to read that. I read that something was going on, so I went away in between meetings. I canceled my next meeting, and I went over to go talk to her. I said, "What's going on? Let's go grab coffee." Unfortunately, I just found out that her brother was diagnosed with cancer, right? And she was really really having a tough time about it. And the number one thing she said to me, she's like, I really appreciate your sense of EQ. This is not a joke. This is not that this was not timed. And I was like, really? She's like, the fact that you even read that and were able to come over and talk to me about it just makes me feel good. Right? And that really goes to that um, reading other people's emotions and reacting to it. It's great to be able to read it, but you also have to be able to react to it. And that's where the relationship management comes in. Now we have built a great relationship, and it has nothing to do with my product management skills, right? Now we've built a great relationship because I've connected on that emotional level. So what's some tips that I learned to help you guys out here, right? Um, first tip is, is it Homer Simpson? <laughs> um, who knows what a lizard brain is? Has anyone ever heard of that concept? I see someone smiling. And that's kind of where, like, if you're a Simpson fan, it's Homer Simpson. Or if you ever watch a movie and you see a bunch of construction workers whistling at a woman that walks by and saying the things that they say, that's the lizard brain, right? You don't think and you just have that primitive reaction. We all do it. It's human nature. We've all done it. We've all done it at some point where you're angry, you're scared, you're fearful, and you just react. You don't think about it and just ugh, lash out and react, right? You have to manage your lizard brain. We all have it. And learning to manage your lizard brain is the number one way to be successful. How do you do that? It's not easy. Um, when you see yourself in that situation where you're getting angry or fearful, try to act. And it's almost kind of take yourself out of your estate. Act as a bystander watching the interaction and watching you. Right? It's interesting when you put yourself out and say, if I was watching myself, what am I reacting? What's my body language? How am I reacting to the situation? That's going to help you kind of contain the lizard brain, the lash out. Use curiosity. I do this all the time. Um, I think Cody and some of the folks on my team have probably picked up on it. When I'm pissed off, I start, using cur I start asking questions. And it actually makes me feel in a better state, too. If someone's upsetting me about something, I'm like, so why do you think that way? So tell me what I think I might have done wrong. Using that level of curiosity back at the person actually helps you control your emotions because your lizard brain is kind of condensing itself. Rename the feeling. I actually literally sit there and think, I'm not angry or fearful. I'm actually just upset, or I'm sad, or I'm hurt, or I'm nervous, or I'm scared. We all have secondary emotions. There's actually a big, I do a lot of, I watch a lot of TED Talks. You guys should watch some on this topic. There's a concept called secondary emotions. With lizard brain, your primary emotion is, I'm angry, I'm scared, I wanna, I'm fearful, I want to la lash out. That's not really the emotion you're feeling. It's just kind of peripheral. The secondary emotion is what you're really feeling, which is, I'm insecure about this. I'm hurt by what the comments are. Once you start understanding that second, de second degree feeling, then the first degree becomes a little bit meaningless, right? So it's really important to kind of learn this concept. It took me a long time, guys, but you got to be able to put your lizard brain aside when you're in these situations. Any questions on lizard brain? I want to make this interactive. Yes. Yep. Good question. If you don't mind, let's table it, because I think I have a slide for that. OK. Uh, just to repeat the question is, if you're working in a global environment, and you're working on the phone or on video chats with folks, how can you pit up, pick up on some of the emotional aspects of it? Oop. Sorry. I'm getting an install of it. Yeah. Um, user empathy. OK, so I think someone mentioned empathy. 
I actually broke up empathy into two topics here. As a product manager, I probably should call this client or consumer empathy. First part of empathy is, listen, as product managers, you've learned it in all your adventures, you need to be close to the user and the client that you're building this product for, right? Fall in love with the problem, not the solution. It's, we're wired as humans to try to always, my wife always tells me this, to be honest with you, is when she's venting to me, it's like, stop trying to fix the solution. I just want you to like fall in love with the problem. <laughs> I just want to vent, right? And I'm like, God, after 15 years, I still don't understand women. Um, but it's, you know, it's really important to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. As product managers, especially if you came from a tech background, you're wired to like, fix, fix, fix. It's not about fix, it's about learning the users. I'll share a quick story. When I was at Goldman, we were building out uh, voice solutions for our Goldman Sachs traders. And you know, whenever I went over and I would present like the coolest thing, we'd say, yeah, your new voice system's gonna be able to do chat over Bloomberg and you can talk to all of Wall Street, blah, blah, blah. They're like, thanks, um, yeah, don't really need that. I never used to get the time of day, right? What I came to realize is that traders actually don't want the cool features. They just wanna do their job more efficiently. So I took another approach where I actually said, let me sit with the assistant of that desk, the managing partner of the desk, the junior trader, the senior trader, building personas, is one of the comments there, and really learning how people work, right? Not try to come up with this cool, fancy solution, but how do people work? What are their challenges today? What are some of their struggles? What are their workflows? What I came to realize is they don't want the bells and whistles. They just want a better system that just does efficiencies for what they do today. They place calls. They go out and communicate in place and execute trades. Then I came back with a better solution, right? And I think it's really important to kind of immerse yourself. Get really into that user and empathize with them and how they work and the problems they solve today. The, th the last bit there, exposure time, I mean, this is kind of one of my mantras. We're talking about this today is don't wait too late to get some of your ideas in front of users. It's really important to get things out early. You might not get the best answer you want, <laughs> but it's important to get a lot of exposure time with your users. Always be there, show them where you're thinking, even if it's just a thought, this is really gonna help them feel like, you're my partner, you're here with me, right? We're together and working on this together. So we were just talking about this today with my team is like, yeah, it's not build for this, just build for this, get it out. Get some feedback, let's iterate, let's iterate, let's iterate. Product 101, iterate, iterate, MVP. But I think the other aspect of it is it also brings that emotional connection. Now it's not your user that is someone that you're building and paying or you know a customer, it's someone that you're working with and building this product together, right? Any questions on users? Yes. Uh, so working for a company like a startup yep. that makes sense, but now you're working on this like financial right yep. Yep. So how do you how do you deal with leadership and management who says, I don't want to put anything in front of our customers that may detract from their experience, so I don't want to use that iterative process. I want to make sure that it's perfect. So yep. Uh, so the question was, in a bigger, in a startup, it's much easier to kind of get in front of your users. In a bigger company, it might be a little bit more difficult because you get resistance. So good question, right? So I actually spend, I was just saying, if I look at my week, I probably spend at least 60% of it talking to our clients or our field reps. This is on the Northwestern Mutual side, right? And I think of a lot of the challenges that you have where you're getting roadblocks of getting in front of the users is show and tell gets you there, okay? A lot of leadership, executives, if you bring slides with bullets, that's exciting. But if you bring an idea and show it as a concept, you'll get a lot more action, right? Where this is what I'm thinking and I really need to run it by some users to see if it's something that we want to invest in and bring to the development team. Before you invest in making something, you better make sure that it's the right idea, right? So the tactics I would use and we use today is to get in front of the field members or to get in front of customers. It only takes one time. If you do this once well, the second time, the third time is much easier. It's really important to come in with showing what you're about to do. It doesn't mean you have to have a mock-up or a product built. It could be an idea, it could be a wireframe, it could be conceptual. If I do a lot of whiteboarding with execs. I don't go in with a presentation. I actually whiteboard and say, this is where I'm thinking. It gives off the perception, and this is actually another part of my, the second slide I'm gonna to get to, is the empathy from the other perspective. It gives off the perception of, wow, he's really passionate and obsessed about this. He really has a great idea. We need to get 
its validation by bringing him in front of some clients. So you're not referring to like an open environment where consumers will actually interact with your product? Um, consumers interact with our products too. In our way, in our space, we have two clients. We have the customer who would buy insurance or a financial plan, but we also have the financial rep or the advisor or the guidance counselor who would sell it. So equally, we're kind of spending time with both. And then, you know, we have inner circles and communities of clients that we would reach out to and just throw a wacky idea in front of. To be honest with you, I think the resistance of leadership or anybody not letting you get in front of clients is actually something you control more than they do. I think it's really important on your, the tactic that you would use with the leadership to get their it out there. Um, I did a, I'll share another quick story with you. We did a, when I first joined at LearnVest, we have a monthly with the entire LearnVest 200 folks, and we just have like you know a speaker series, and we have people come up with slides on cool the stuff they're working on, right? And I told my team the first time we were asked to do it, I'm like, we're doing no slides. We're doing absolutely no slides. Everyone's gonna come up for 10 minutes and show. They're gonna log into the actual client website. They're gonna come out with the mobile app. Depending what space you're working on, you're gonna show. You're not gonna you're gonna show and tell and talk. Back in kindergarten, remember we used to have show and tell? Let's go back that way. And it was, and somebody came over to me and he's like one of the engineers and he's like, you know, I gotta tell you, you and your team put on a great show. You know, it wasn't a presentation, it was a great show. And for me, that was like a comment I'm never gonna forget. I was so proud of my team because we put on a show, right? And the show really helps drive more discussion and opens up more opportunities for you. Team empathy. So as important as it is for users, we all understand that, right? I think product managers forget this a lot. It's really important to be engaging with your team as well. When I mean team, I mean your business stakeholders, your technology team, your designers, anybody you work with, right? There's a lot of different personalities. You really need to understand the personalities. Make time for people. This is like the simplest thing we can all do and we all forget to do it. I make it a point, and I've been doing this for almost 11 years now, and actually, <laughs> sadly, I drink too much coffee now from it, but three 30 minutes in my calendar is always coffee. I just block it out with somebody that I don't know in the organization, right? This week, my coffee chat was with the new person that just started in marketing. She's, the, she's two years in marketing, and it was a great conversation, and I learned a lot about her. My second coffee chat was with, actually talking about the virtual comment, someone in our Arizona office who just started in the planning team and it was a virtual chat. It wasn't really a coffee, I guess. It was more like a virtual coffee. Um, and my third coffee chat was with someone that just started on our engineering team. I make time, I just block it out of my calendar and I make sure, and then every time I have a coffee, I'm like, who else on your team that can I have coffee with? You gotta make time for people and you really need to make that time and build those relationships and kind of feed off those emotions. That's what's gonna make you successful as a product manager. Remember, we live in the gray, right? So it's really important for us to kind of learn that personality, empathize with people, learn their background, and connect on a deeper level. Um, get genuine, you know, I open up, I get deeper, I share what I'm doing. I mean, you know, I, I, when, if I sometimes when I walk in the room, I'll say, how's your son doing? He told me that he's gonna be playing soccer this year. Or, hey, did you ever get on that second date with the girl that you met, right? It's really important because it just lightens up the room, right? And that's what you really need to kind of move the train forward. Um, verbal context clues, nonverbal clues. You know, I think this is a really important one. We're gonna do an exercise at the end of this session, but it's really important to pick up people's nonverbal cues. Actually, I think there was a study done by Gartner um, 13, oh, was it 13? Yeah, 6% of what we say is actually by the words, right? 94% of it is actually by our verbal, <laughs> nonverbal actions, right? You can tell if someone's sad, not by their words, but by the way they act. You can tell how people are feeling by their emotions, by the way they act and the way they're perceived, right? So it's really important to be able to pick up on nonverbal cues. This has nothing to do with product management, but I actually took a course all about picking up nonverbal cues. It's been the most helpful thing I've done in my entire 15 career years of career, right? It's really important to pick up on that because again, you're gonna be making decisions and the team's gonna be looking for you for guidance. So you need to know how they're feeling, right? And this is one of the tips that I use when I walk into the room 
in that meeting. I pick up on who's there, who's checked out, who's not feeling well. Um, I've actually done this with this room already when I first started, so you know I'm not stalkering you guys, but it's just <laughs> important to pick up on those verbal cues. This is so simple, but Jesus Christ, say hi and smile, right? Like we kind of get wrapped up in our day to day every day. Just like we're people, right? Um, in the end of the day, I sell life insurance. I don't perform heart surgery, <laughs> right? Nobody in this room, unless it's any doctors. Okay. No doctors. So you're not saving lives. It's just a job, right? We all have our personal life. Say hi, smile. Just, you know, it's not that critical. We're not saving lives in most of the work we're doing. Any questions on that? And a little bit, touching a little bit on the virtual, like just sharing my example, I had that virtual coffee chat, as I say, but I think it's important to use video when you can. And, you know, even on the phone, you can pick up a lot about someone's tone. Um, and a lot of these things, you don't really have to physically be there. You can ask people how they're doing in their personal life over the phone or over video chat. I try to use video over phone a lot more. Um, I think video in general is, it can be intimidating because you get to see a picture of somebody, but it also helps you kind of pick up on some of these clues. Oh, you know, I always forget this, but I want to share one more story about this. Uh, one of my really close dev leads, he's a really good buddy now when I started at LearnVest, this is the guy that like everybody is scared of. Right? Like nobody wants to talk to him. He's abrasive and rude and says, like, you don't know what the hell you're doing, right? Everyone's scared of him, but he gets shit done. Like this guy always delivers and gets it done, but he his IQ is high, his EQ is low, right? And I was just so fascinated about this guy. Like, you know, he's like he's a genius, but nobody can work with him and everyone's scared of him. So one day, uh, he was staying late, and like you know, we have alcohol at LearnVest, so that's a good selling point if anyone's looking for a career. Um, but he like took a whiskey and he just poured it, and he was sitting at the pantry. I'm like, and I love whiskey by the way. So I walk over and I took a whiskey, and I'm like, so dude, tell me more about yourself. And this guy is the nicest guy in the world when he had a few drinks, right? And I actually came to realize that wow, and now we're actually really good buddies, and we are great partners in what we put out, but. Again, if I didn't spend that time and connect it on the way and learn his emotions and who he is, we would have never been at this place. So working those team dynamics and what learning the person is really, really important. Don't be a perfectionist. Um, I think this is one issue that a lot of product managers have. They're always trying to you know, look for the right answer. Um, you know, unfortunately, in product, most of the times there is no right answer. Sometimes you just gotta kinda take a guess and move forward, right? Um, you know, so I think you know, a lot of times just keep pushing forward. This goes back to start small, iterate, iterate, iterate. And if you make a mistake, that's okay. You have to be able to adapt and move forward. Learn from it, stay cool, and keep moving forward, right? Um, product managers can never be perfectionists. That's just a part of our trade. We need to just keep moving. I think of ourselves as the train conductor. People are going to get into the train and get off. Like People will be a part of the process and the project and all that good stuff. It could be a quick project. It could be a multi-year project. It doesn't matter. But you've got to keep moving the train. If you're not moving the train, then the project or the product comes to a halt, right? Um, and sometimes you'll miss a stop or you might stay too long at a stop. But it's important to just keep moving forward. And this actually takes a lot of time. It sounds easy, but it takes a lot of time to learn this skill. And it's important to just kind of be mindful and appreciative of that. Um, I'll share another story. Um, I tell uh, everybody this. There's someone on my team. She's brilliant. She's one of the smartest product managers that I have on the team. And you know, I gave her some critical feedback about the project. And she actually started crying, <laughs> right? She was like, what are you trying to say? My product's not good, blah, 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 and got really defensive. And I said, no, I'm just giving you feedback that I don't think that you're approaching this the right way. Try this, maybe get in front of some users, think about it. Number one irony of product managers, unless you work for like Apple or Facebook, is 98% of the time, the product that you're building, you're actually never gonna use personally yourself. You're actually building it for somebody else. That's the irony, right? So never get married to your product. Don't become a perfectionist. Don't have it your way. Don't get obsessed and married to it. Because the irony is it's not for you. It's probably for somebody else. So you need to be able to adapt. And don't be a perfectionist when you're building this out. Be OK with there's some feedback. Get some research behind it. And adjust the course if you need to.
Fair? Um, Work-life balance. I know this sounds cheesy, but I, I'm a Cody, you can't tell anybody at Learn Best, but I take an hour every day and I go to the gym during work hours, right? I block out my calendar and I do it. I told you about the three coffee chats. Um, health is important. If you don't have your health, you don't have your family, you don't have your personal, you're just not gonna be productive as a person. Forget product management, right? Make sure you check out. You need to check out. You need to, I know it gets tough if you're in a heated project or anything. If anyone has a release on my team and they work late, they automatically get to work from home on Friday. Like you don't have to put in our logging system, just go do you what you need to do, right? It's important to check out because it's gonna make you stronger. It's just, this is not even a product thing, guys. A product is especially more important, but just as a human, we need to check out. Please be mindful of this and try to embrace it because it's hard to kind of remember this but it's really important to just kind of brings your stress levels down, right? You're gonna, all the things we've talked about actually can be fixed just by having work-life balance. Your lizard brain will go away, you'll read people's emotions better, you'll just have that mantra. So, you know, table stake, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, I think you guys get it. Be a change agent, embrace the change, don't be afraid of it, tackle it head on, adjust course. I think we've talked about this a little bit already, but it's important to change and adapt, right? Um, there's, uh, there's someone on my team um, who's working, actually Cody knows him well, um, who's working on a project right now and we're building out an entirely new product. It's never been built out before, right? And there's five people that have different opinions and I told the product manager on my team is, no, 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 I'm just gonna do it this way. No, 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 I'm just gonna do it away. This is the right way. And what we came to realize is like, you need to adjust course, right? It's not, and we've backed up with data, we've talked to other stakeholders, you have to be able to adapt to change. That's unfortunately the world that product managers live in. A lot of our job is actually living in the gray, being a politician, getting people's feedback. It might not be the answer you want, but that's okay. Remember, you're not getting married to this. It might be the answer that's good for the greater good, right? So be able to adapt and always be able to change. Have a robust emotional vocabulary. This is an interesting one. Um, only th uh, there's a study that only 36% of people can actually do this. Um, but understand why you're feeling a certain way. Describe situations with that underlying feeling that we talked about. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's really important to just kind of make sure that you understand emotions by actually saying them at times, right? So, you know, I whenever I'm in a situation where I'm not feeling good, I actually like after the meeting. I don't react, I don't talk to anybody, I literally go outside for a walk. We live in New York City, like why wouldn't you wanna go for a walk? It's amazing out, right? And there's just amazing experiences. I think it's really important to be able to accept an, uh, an emotion you're feeling and talk about it. Talk about it in your head, have the vocabulary around it, use the context clues, understand what you're feeling and say it to yourself. I have, um, what I like to call is like, I have my three circles. There's the inner circle, the second circle, and the third circle. The third circle are the people that you just deal with day in and day out. The second circle are like, they're kind of the peripherals that you bring in as you need it for your work or your projects. It's kind of like Facebook almost. Your first degree, second degree, third, well, I'm out gaining myself because it's not even Facebook. It was a thing before Facebook, which I can't remember. MySpace or something like that. Nobody's old enough to remember that. But the second circle is kind of the core people, right? The 10 people you work with in and out, your dev lead, your this, your that, right? And you guys should all have your three circles and think about who your people are in these circles. Then it's that middle core circle. This is like two or three people, not more than that. But these are the people that I can just bounce anything off of. Like, it really pissed me off when ABC said this. What do you think? Do you think I'm overreacting? Like, this is those folks that you turn to and talk about those things that are your emotional vocabulary, those day-to-day -day things. I practice this since I started at Goldman. I try to have the one, two, three circles. Everyone has three, everyone has two. Really focus on who are those two or three people that you can trust and you can just be yourself and let loose and let understand. You need to be able to bounce things off someone else that you trust to be able to get good feedback and understand how your emotions are and what's the right tone and vocabulary there. Curious about people. Um, you know, I talked about the coffee chats, the beer chats, the whiskey. Generally, just want to know how people 
what makes people tick, right? What are they understanding? Um, I'll share a funny story with you. Our marketing team has went through a huge evolution. Uh, when I first started, the marketing team was more kind of growth hackers. So they're like developers that like just knew how to talk and put cool colors together. So they called themselves the marketing team, right? Um, but now we have like a real marketing team that understands brand and customer voice and all that good stuff. And me being a technologist and an engineer by heart and more of a technical orientated product manager, I kind of was like, oh my God, I miss those guys and gals that were like the growth hackers, right? And then I was like, God, I'm sitting in a marketing meeting talking about brand and customer voice. Like, oh man, this doesn't feel good. I came to realize after spending time with the marketing team is, wow, that's really important. I didn't understand that that's what makes you guys tick. And I have this whole newfound appreciation about, hey, you know what? We say looks don't matter, but when you're building a product, looks do matter. The colors, the palettes, the tone, the voice, the copy, the imagery, right? Um, you know, the other day I was on the plane and I was coming back and one of the marketing folks sent me a link and I clicked on it and it was a beautiful family that had this Northwestern Mutual ad and I never thought of myself doing this and I'm like, that's a really good image. And you used amazing imagery and copy in this and I was like, what am I saying? <laughs> um, but I, you know, just the curiosity of getting close to a, a space that doesn't excite you or doesn't make you passionate really brings this newfound appreciation. I would have never known how much I appreciated all of this if I didn't spend time with our new marketing lead or if I didn't understand what makes them tick, understand their background. It's really important to just kind of learn other people. Put your ego aside. Go, if you don't think something's exciting, just make that 30 minute chat understand where they're coming from. You might actually shock yourself. You might actually think that it's really cool and exciting. I went through the same evolution with design too, by the way. If there's any designers, love design now. Appreciate it completely now that I understand what makes designers tick. Ooh. Um, final is like, hey, we always have this toxic person, right? Think about in your adventures in your life, the person that like you just seem to never get along with. Whatever you do, you do it wrong. Whatever you say, you say it wrong. You know, I think that's one of the folks that really challenge your EQ skills, right? When you're faced with that situation, and if you haven't faced it, you will one day. Faced it many times. I think it's really important for you to neutralize those toxic folks, right? Um, how do you do that? You're never going to win, but you don't want to lose, right? So you meet in the middle. So I think this is definitely one of those places where you have to find the common ground. You have to walk into a meeting with a toxic person just putting your feelings aside, and it's all business, right? If somebody wants Z, you want A, where can you meet in the middle where both are happy? Um, so I think, you know, don't hold grudges, don't, uh, doesn't affect you, doesn't bring you down. I'll share a great story with you. Um, Someone on my design team and I, actually, you know what, the head of design and I have really kind of been in different odds, right? Um, you know, the design team is more of a shared model and it's an agency model where the product manager is, every single product manager manages one vertical, right? So as we need designers, we tap into whoever is available. The shared model, in my opinion, has never worked because I think you should have a product manager and a designer working together on a project and they, there's two pilots on a plane for a reason, right? Um, so the two pilots on the plane work together. And we've had this disagreement about this topic for about a year. And we finally came to a good place. And I said, you know, I agree with you. Shared makes sense. But why don't we have shared across certain disciplines where we have four or five designers that work on mobile, four or five designers that work on client, four or five designers that work on planning. This way we still have that shared distribution. But at least people are a little bit more specialized. We now have that, right? And we met in the middle where it found a way that it works for both teams. So you're gonna be faced with this quite a bit and I think it's really important to just neutralize and find that common ground. Any questions? Because I have a really exciting exercise that we're gonna to do together. But before we go there, questions. Let's, well, let's go there first. Thank you, this is very interesting. Yep. Yeah, so a question was when you're brand new and how do you kind of get going, right, and figure things out. 
Um, you know, when I look at every single role that I've taken on, I think the first 30 days is really, and this is actually pretty interesting, most people are, as humans, we're wired to like see result. So we're more wired as, did, in our minds, it's like, how can I come in and make the greatest impact and show that I did a win, right? Um, if you actually take that route, you're probably not gonna be that successful. What I take the route and I learned is, because I failed in doing that, is the first 30 days is actually learning how people and the process works. How do we get things done here? Who's the right people that make the decisions? Who's gonna be the people I partner with? So it goes back to a lot of those chats, learn, learn. You almost wanna come in like, I have no idea, teach me. Like, give me the 101. The knowledge is power. The more you learn from people, then you can have a bigger win, right? As opposed to having a smaller win. So my advice to you would be is really embrace yourself in the team again. Learn who's out there, learn how the process works. Is this a whiteboard um, company or is this a meetings company, right? Who, do I need to involve this team or only this team? Like, who are the key players? And I actually ask people, I'm like, so what do you do here? Like, you know, what is the thing that I need to do and how can I help you? And how can, and the natural question they ask is, how can I help you, right? And I think a lot of that, before you can be really impactful, you really just need to learn the organization. Um, I mean, going back to the entrepreneurial fashion. Yep. Um, so the first you talked about, you know, team empathy. Yep. Take people out for drinks, go to cocktail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you have that one person that's really kind of shutting you down or yep. shutting meetings down, yep. um, what are some other points of error? I mean, have you taken that person out for your personal? Level? Yeah. So it's really important to remember that not everyone's going to be your friend, okay? I think coworkers are and friends aren't always the same, right? In some cases, they could be. That's great. But you know, everybody that you work with doesn't have to be your friend. If you're trying to make everyone be your friend, then this thing's not going to work. There's always going to be people that you're just doing business with, right? So I, you can take the coffee chat approach and all that. That might not work with somebody that just doesn't see eye to eye with you. I think then you have to treat it more as a business transaction. So what I do is, we need to do this deliverable. Can we get together and really talk how we're going to do the suit? And then, you know, I, I actually have my son do this all the time, right? He's actually, like, playing soccer. He's really good at soccer, and he's, he's deciding, does he do travel soccer or club soccer? And they both have advantages and all this crazy stuff. And I said, Jaden, why don't you take a piece of paper, make a line in the middle, and write your feelings about both, you know? Travel, he gets to be with his friends. Club, he doesn't know anybody. But club, it's a better coach. Um, so he gets to learn more. And he made this analysis, and he's like, I think I'm going to go with that. And I actually try to take that approach when I'm in a situation like that, is let's literally put a line and say, what are your thoughts on this? What are my thoughts on this? And the answer is a circle of combination of both. Cool, we agree, let's go off to our next meeting, right? So I think uh, you have to, with folks where you're at odds, try to treat, if, you, if the coffee chat and all that doesn't work, Again, they're not gonna be your friends, but try to treat it as where do we make others common down? And sometimes it's simple as, listing, listing, and finding the right middle that makes everyone happy. By the way, you have to give too, right? It's in a give a take. You have to realize that in this situation, you can't win them all, right? Um, so where can we find what's right for the organization, right for the client, and find that happy medium? I hope that answers it, and we can probably spend some time afterwards discussing it more. So a key part of the five minutes of John is saying no yep. when it comes to the roadmap. Yep. Yeah, so I think an easy way to say no to whether it's a client, someone on the team, et cetera, is back it up, right? I mean, if someone wants to put a button on a screen, I'm using a simple example, and you just think the button doesn't make sense, ask 100 people, does the button make sense, right? So one way is taking research, data, qualitative, quantitative to back that up. Um, so that's actually kind of the simple answer of like yes or no. But the other part of saying no is an art. Never use the word no <laughs> is the first thing, right? When you're working, this is actually something I was thinking about adding here, and we can do a whole separate talk on this. Negotiating is another big part of product management, right? Because you live in the gray and because everyone won't be your friend, it's really important to learn how to negotiate and give and take, right? Um, if somebody says they want to put this entire feature in 
and you've backed it up with data that maybe only some aspects of it make sense? Do you correct course and bring some components of it and then say kick the can down the road for another aspect of it? Do you kind of move the conversation in a different way where we're talking about different elements? So there's no magic answer to this, right? It's more of an art than a science. But a lot of it is, you should act, if you haven't, you should take a class on negotiating. And you should take a class on learning emotions. By the way, if you don't have the time for a class, just watch some TED Talks. There's some amazing ones out there. Tony Robbins is one. There's a lot out there that just teach you some of this. And it's, it's, you know, I think it really boils down to never say no. It's more about negotiate, where you can give somebody and give something where they feel happy about it, and then you can correct course and think about how we do versioning and how we kind of kick the can down the road. Because frankly, people's opinion might change anyway as you move along in the project. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for the presentation. So in general, this is a really big product management and yep. innovation um, speaking in general. Are there any good books that you um, yeah, so I think there's tons of books out there. I'll be honest with you, just in my general mantra, even in product in general, there's tons and tons of books. They're great. Remember when we were in college and we did all these courses and it was great books and then we realized we had our first job that none of that really made sense or mattered because the real world isn't like that? There's tons of books out there and if you want to read them, read them. I would suggest blogs, TED Talks, because now you're really, product school, because um, now you're getting real opinion from folks that are in the industry, right? So my general advice to you on this is go to TED Talks, go look up some blogs. Um, Living in the Gray is a good book. Um, true North is a good book, which is really like, what's the true answer in the guidance? It's not really what you think it is. It's actually your self-awareness. So there's a lot more on that. The irony is you're probably for a lot of this, the EQ aspect of it, is you're not reading product books. You're actually reading more about self-awareness books that are going to guide you to the right answer. And again, I'm a firm believer that product management is so much about EQ versus any of our other roles that might be in the organization. Blogs, books, TED Talks, some of that stuff. I think we had one more, yeah. Hi, Rebecca. In your experience, have you noticed any variation involving EQ uh, from large to small companies? Yes, um, good question. Uh, I think that what I've learned is the grass is greener on the other side, by the way. It, it, small company, big company, the real answer is some working model of both. Um, big companies is a lot more meetings, process, get people to buy in. So it really tests your EQ about, you know, just to even move the train in my example, you just have to get a lot of people on board, right? So it's a lot more about storytelling, selling your idea, talking about the risks, going back, right? Smaller companies, you probably don't face a lot of that. It's a lot more, let's whiteboard, cool, let's push it out <laughs> tomorrow, right? Um, but that has its cons too because you might make a mistake, right? And the mistake might need to be corrected. So I think to going back to the EQ example, in smaller companies, um, you know, it's a little bit more close-knit, so you get more extra time. And I think in bigger companies, you might have to get uh, spend um, some more time working the organization to figure out who the key stakeholders are. One thing I'll tell you is big company versus startup is really interesting for me. Um, when I go back to Milwaukee, where Northwestern Mutual is based out of, I'm the youngest <laughs> because people, it's like Goldman, right? There's people who have been there for years. When I'm at LearnVest, I think I might be the oldest. Right? So I think I, that's been an interesting ma dynamic, managing two teams with two different cultures. And a lot of my time is actually spent learning how do we get these cultures together, which has a lot to do with EQ, right? How do you get a young developer that's you know, wearing jeans, ripped jeans, and you know, that typical startup style, drinking a beer and wants to push out the code tomorrow, versus someone who's been in the industry and the company for 20 years and is really focused on compliance and reputational risk, how do you get those cultures to get together and actually deliver this thing, right? That's a really hard problem and it's been really, I've been really thankful in my role to be able to be faced with that because not many places do you get to get that experience. A lot of that is spending time with the emotions, but it's actually, you're kind of the mediator, <laughs> right? I actually spend the time getting, being the matchmaker and helping the EQs across both, which is, really cool, and you only get that in certain environments. Any other questions? One more. So, uh, from side to side, how do you keep the respect to recognize who are having a good language? Like how yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, so the question was, how do you represent EQ on your resume? Um, you know, this is a really tough one, to be honest with you, because I think we, 
sadly make too many decisions based off a resume if you were here in the beginning i told my two minute story again i asked people in an interview what your two minute story and you know i think i really didn't look at a resume this is really bad i really spend more of my time learning the person and seeing how they emotionally sell themselves um, I do think in a resume, it's really hard to come off with your emotional side, but I think what you should use is be cognizant of the vocabulary you use, right? I think it's really important to kind of, you know, there's met, if your resume sounds robotic when you read it out to yourself, that's probably not a good thing. You can use emotional words to drive your resume. I actually learned this a long time ago, is like, you know, if you think about the bullets on your resume, like lead project, blah, 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 or you know, drove project BBB, but it's more interesting to be like, inspired a team to come together across disciplines such as marketing, product, and technology. Inspire, right? Uh, motivate. When a lot of words like that, if I was reading it, I would say, wow, this person's really thought about their emotional aspect of it, right? They're just using that tone in itself is very empowering. I think we're done. Thank you. Hopefully this was great, useful. If you want to find me, that's the way to find me. I always, sorry about the slide here, I always leave with this one quote when I talk about emotions. I can choose to let it define me, confine me, refine me, outshine me, or I can choose to just move on and leave it behind me, right? So I think it's really important when you're kind of going through your product journeys to you know let some moments just get behind you and just keep moving forward and keep running ahead. Thank you guys, I'll be around if you have any questions.